feast already. I don't feel we need to preach because this was amazing. And Shelley, that was... So, it's God. I know it. I know. But when we were dancing at the front, I really felt the power of God here. And I, I suddenly began to cl- cut my, put my arms up over my eyes because I knew he was here. And I knew I, I, can't, I can't look, you know? And, I, I, and it was just so holy. And Margaret then came out with her flags. You know, the flags were, were going, and it was just wonderful. But Margaret came out with her flags. And I knew that God, it was, it, it was the holiness of God. And he, it was as if he was dancing and I wanted to dance with him, you know. And I almost said, please, let's come up and dance with God, you know. Um, it was just so holy. Well, I just just want to, um, you know, first of all, I want to thank uh, Maz because she made me laugh earlier. Because she said to me, <laughs> she said, I love your funeral outfit. <laughs> And I said, thanks. <laughs> but I thought I looked rather like Becky. You remember Becky last night? Becky came as a nun. <laughs> so, wasn't it an amazing evening? Yeah. Such an amazing evening. Um, and this might look a lot, but it's in font 16 because I can't see very well. <laughs> okay. Um, we're now at the end of the autumn feasts, aren't we? And it's the time of the ingathering, and it's a time of joy and thanksgiving for what God has given us, his abundant blessings. And as we know, this was the time that Yeshua was born. The time when he first tabernacled with us. Emmanuel, God with us. It's the appointed times of our God, the God of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The only true God. There's many gods, but no, nobody's like our God. For me, the feasts, and I think for you all, have like three levels of understanding in, in time. There's past, present, and future. But we're all with the same intention to point us to Yeshua, the Savior who restores us back to God, the lover of our souls. And I, I put it like this. It's, and I want to read it because I just think it's what it is. Yahweh's perfect picture of... This is what I'm talking about, the feast now. Yahweh's perfect picture of salvation, painted in history through the seen works of his appointed times, which are to be kept throughout all generations. Yeshua is the fulfillment of all the feasts. We know that from Passover to Tabernacles. And his ultimate plan... And in the final culmination on the eighth day, when God makes a promise, he keeps it. I'm going to read from Isaiah 46. And I'm going to miss the verses out. It's from, it's from, it's from verse 10, but I'm going to do it sort of like I'm taking chunks out of it so we don't have to read the, the whole scriptures. So... You might get a bit lost, but anyway. God speaks about declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Indeed, I have spoken it and I will also do it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. 
Can you remember about six months ago, I think it was about that, when um, Lorraine Waddle came here from Ireland and she talked about Ezekiel's wheel and how God uses cycles of times and events to keep us on his ancient paths. In fact, Margaret prayed about the ancient paths today, about God keeping us on them. And unfortunately, our church fathers have certainly taken us off the paths. And those paths were paths of righteousness. In Leviticus, God commands us to keep the feasts, to use them as part of his design, to be a perpetual cycle of righteousness, never ending. Have you ever heard the expression, life's not a dress rehearsal? And I used to agree with that. Now, so I would do everything I wanted to do because it wasn't a dress rehearsal. I was only going to do it once. So I did what I wanted to do. But I actually believe, you know, that it is a rehearsal. Life is a rehearsal. And God wants us to be prepared. He wants us to know what's happening. It's as though he's saying to us, keep my times, keep my feasts, and keep repeating and keep rehearsing and practicing them over and over again. They'll become a part of you, and as you keep them, you will understand their significance, and you will find hidden gems. which I can honestly say, in learning and keeping history, since I've been doing it, we've been doing it for about, I think we've been here for seven, seven years now, and we still only understand Passover. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. We understand them all. But each time you do a feast, you learn more and more. And it's also, it's, an, it's not just learning. It is relevant to our walk with him, most relevant. People say, why do you keep the feast? Well, it's obvious to me, but I know there's a relevance to God in each of these feasts. So we know the spring feasts have already been fulfilled by Yeshua. And we also understand that the latter feasts, the autumn feasts, are still yet to be fulfilled. Prophecy yet to be fulfilled is actually called, and I've got to get this right, because those of you scholars will know it, it's called eschatology. Say it again. That was what I said, wasn't it? <laughs> and it's the doctrine of last things. That's what it's in you know, the meaning of it. So, trumpets, Yom Terah, atonement, Yom Kippur, tabernacles, Sukkot, and all those that will take place when Yeshua returns. So today, I'm actually going to speak on the eighth day, which comes at the end of the seven-day Feast of Tabernacles. The eighth day is one of the most meaningful, yet least understood of the holy days in Christian circles. In fact, I don't think, until I came here, I don't think I'd ever heard of the eighth day. And many people will have different perceptions, slightly different timing, because when the Lord speaks about the eighth day, we know that it's a new beginning. And that day isn't just a day. Because we all know the scripture about a day in the Lord is like a thousand elsewhere. It also has multifacets. And actually, I have to say this to you, Mike. It could actually, t if you actually studied it, it would actually take longer than Mike's Song of Songs. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to give my little bit. And, and, and also, I was thinking, you know, Mike, <laughs> if you did do it, we would be here till eternity. <laughs> 
sorry. Get you back for the snoring. <laughs> Not that it was you, but... <laughs> okay. However, it's all about, the eighth day is all about God's ultimate plan, a new beginning, eternity with Yeshua. So I'm going to speak from my understanding using some biblical facets of the eighth day scriptures, past and future. But before I do, I know we all laugh when everybody mentions Leviticus, <laughs> especially 23. <laughs> but it's actually the best book in the Bible, and it's quoted as being, saying this, showing the instructions on holiness and cleanliness. It also compares the holiness of God to sinful man. And I felt a bit like that before. You know, when I said, I couldn't look for God. I knew he was here, but I couldn't look for him because he's so holy. And it also tells us about how sin is just such an abomination to him. And when we sin, often we don't know that we're sinning. And, you know, and, and there are times, yes, we do. But even the times that we don't know, that must be awful for God because he sees it and we don't. So for, I'll just have a drink. And I'm going to excuse myself from coughing. I've got this awful cough. But I've taken some uh, medicine that stops you coughing. <laughs> I'm going to start at Leviticus 23, verse 37. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies for bringing food offerings to the Lord. The burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices, drink offerings required for each day. These offerings are in addition to those of the Lord's Sabbaths and in addition to your gifts and whatever you have vowed and all the free will offerings you give to the Lord. Just to make a point here, we as believers, we know that only sacrifices we are to make today are the sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. But I'm going to read the relevant scriptures because the feasts will still be taking place in the millennium. So, Leviticus 23, verse 39. Beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival of the Lord for seven days. The first day is a Sabbath, rest, and the eighth day also is a day of Sabbath rest. Note here, the first and the eighth day are Sabbath rests. Numbers 29, verse 35. Don't turn to them because they're any short. On the eighth day, you shall have a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. The eighth day is separate, and it comes after the seventh day feast of tabernacles. It's not a feast but it's a solemn assembly, a holy day. As the name implies, sober and reverent occasion and a sacred occasion. So this is a long scripture if you do want to follow it, but it's Genesis 17, 9 to 14. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. Sorry, the covenants you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you for the generations to come. Every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner. Those who, those who are, are, are not your offspring as well, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is that to be an everlasting covenant, 
and any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So all firstborn males were to be dedicated to the Lord and they were to be circumcised. Being circumcised was a symbolic, it's symbolic of you being in, all the males being in submission to God and being in perfect covenant with him. Yeshua was actually circumcised on the eighth day and he was obedient unto death. However, as we as believers know that physical circumcision is not required, but circumcision of the heart is. Animal sacrifices were to be offered on the eighth day. The animals were to be kept with their mothers until that time. There is a reason, and I think it's something to do with the blood, but because I didn't specifically know it, I can't quote it, can't say it. Afterwards, after that eighth, after those seven days, they were um, to be, they could be offered as a sacrifice to the Lord. The first seven days were actually for preparation, making sure that there was no blemish or deformity, counting towards and looking forward to the eighth day when the offering was presented to God. And I, I the next scripture, when I was reading, I thought, gosh, this is actually in chapter 8. Moses first pre pre prepared Aaron and his sons for their service as priests to God at the tabernacle. After being washed, clothed in priestly garments, and sprinkled with blood, they stayed in the tabernacle for seven days whilst they were being consecrated, whilst they were being prepared which was on the eighth day. Only then would they be clean enough to make offerings for the people and to be able to fulfill their priestly duties. In Leviticus 15, verse 3, when a man is cleansed from his discharge, he is to count off seven days for his ceremonial cleansing. He must wash his clothes and bathe himself with fresh water, and he will be clean on the eighth day. Women bathed in the mikvah on the eighth day of their menstrual cycle. Some Jewish ladies still actually do that. Religious Jewish ladies still actually do that. Solomon's temple was cleansed on the eighth day in the reign of Hezekiah when it had been desecrated. Yeshua cleansed the temple as he was walking through the arches in the courtyard of the Gentiles by overturning the money changers' tables and driving out the animals. Yeshua wanted that to be cleansed for the nations. See, the, the, the sort of it, because it was in the court of the Gentiles, that's where the nation bit come, actually comes in. Um, as Aaron mentioned next week, in the millennium, the nations would be keeping the feasts in the, in, and traveling to Jerusalem. Those nations who don't keep the appointed times will have no blessing. And there will still be people born in, in, at that time in the millennium. And there will still be a reason to do those. And the reason is because they will need to be taught how offensive sin is to a holy, righteous God. So the animal sacrifices will serve as a reminder about the righteous God. However, it is impossible for the blood of goats or any animal to take away the sin. Amen. Only Yeshua can do that. Amen. Zechariah fourteen sixteen and I'll read it, tells us that after the tribulation, those who survive, survive from all the nations will have to go up to Jerusalem each year, worship Yeshua, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. 
He doesn't say that you sh you sure, but you, you get my meaning. Isaiah 56, 6 to 8. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be with his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane holds fast to my co covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. That's us. We're the nations. The burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Amen. Ezekiel 37. Sorry about the many scriptures, but you know they're there to be read and they're there for a purpose. They will, in Ezekiel 37, 23. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses, for I will save them from their sinful backsliding and I will cleanse them. They will be my people and I will be their God. <coughs> so we understand that the eighth day, when everything will be new and clean and sanctified, for those who have chosen Yeshua, we know that Yom Terah, the time of the blowing of the trumpets, marks, it's, it's a clarion call, isn't it? It, it? It's got to be loud and clear. And it's a warning, and it's a warning to get ready. Can I open this door? Because I'm actually boiling. Is everybody else? Oh, thank you. Um, I know. And I'm watching you all in case you fall asleep, Mike Fryer. Saw you. <laughs> Thank you. And it warns us of the coming of the bridegroom. Matthew 25, at the time of the kingdom of heaven, will be like the ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take their oil. This is the preparing. The wise ones took oil in the jars with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they all got drowsy and fell asleep. <laughs> At midnight, the cry came out, Here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, replied. they replied, There may not be enough for both of us, and you instead... Uh, uh, both of us and you, I can't, there's something missing here. Go to those who sell oil and buy something for yourselves. But while they were away buying the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins were ready and they went to him and they were at the wedding banquet and the door was shut. You know, we must be ready and waiting like those five wise virgins who kept the oil burning. We have to keep the Lord's feasts. And we have to keep his commandments. That's what it's all about, the Torah. Our instructions for life. And we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily, daily... Uh, it, it's not just saying we're filled with the Holy Spirit because we can get a bit dry. We have to continuously be filled we have to have our daily manna our daily bread the living bread we have to have Yeshua daily so in ancient bridal times the father of the groom would choose the bride for his son and only the best would do she was chosen just like we're chosen The Father chose us before the foundation of the world. That's hard to see, isn't it? But he did. And that's in Ephesians 1.4. John 6.44. No man can come to me except the Father who has sent him draw me. And I will raise him up on the last day. Those scriptures are such an encouragement to me. Because we are chosen, and we will not be forsaken. And we have to hold on to all of that. 
especially when the enemy will sit and tell you you're rubbish and you're no good we're chosen by him before the foundation of the world amen going back to the marriage in those times an, agree an agreement was made a diary was given and a contract was drawn up just like the one you were going to do for your wedding <laughs> did you do that one no but you don't need it do you um yeah we hadn't got time to do it that day do you remember one of the promises of what the bridegroom would make would be that he would give himself for his bride. Yeshua did that completely. When he gave his life on the cross, where he bled and died, and he paid with his life, he fulfilled that contract. A betrothal ceremony takes place, and it's called in Hebrew, uh, you Hebrew scholars, and I'll probably say it wrong, but it's called a, a Russian Rushin? No. It's a, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word for betrothal. And its meaning is a mutual promise or contract for a future marriage yet to come. However, the bridegroom has to be separated for a while after the ceremony. Wait a moment. Let me check. So he goes away and he goes back to his father's house to make ready for his bride. Matthew 14, 2. In my father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, you will be also. During this time, the bride, us, she's preparing for that day. She's on full alert. She's completely on. She's, she's waiting. I'm waiting. We're all waiting, aren't we? Are we keeping ourselves prepared? She's setting herself apart. She's keeping our garments white. And I was thinking about when Margaret was also dancing with the flags, the white garments. She does whatever it takes to make herself ready for him. But they don't know the hour of the bridegroom. Yeshua doesn't even know the hour when he's coming for his bride. He has to wait for his approval from his father. Matthew 24, 36 says, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels, but my Father only. Yeshua was prophetically talking about end times. Finally, the bridegroom would come. The ceremony would take place under the, ca under the canopy, which we call the chuppah. It's a picture of the Sukkot of God's covering. Yeshua talked about other weddings. Matthew 22, verse 10. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was filled with reclining guests. And the king came... And the king coming in and looking over his guest, he saw a man that did not have a wedding garment on. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. I don't want my teeth to gnash. For many are called, few are chosen. Those who are truly Yeshua's are preparing for him to come. And we do this, don't we, by repenting, 
being washed in his blood, using the garments of praise, through gratitude, thanksgiving, these are our preparations, and keeping the feasts. They're so important. We must be about our Father's business. Are we keeping our garments clean? Are we reading our Bibles? Are we setting ourselves by reading the Torah? Do we keep the Sabbaths and God's feasts? We need to be ready for that trumpet call. We know there's going to be such destruction when Yeshua comes, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just talking about them and going to the millennium now. There will be a period of peace on the earth for a thousand years. There will be no wars, and things that had previously been used for wars will be turned into farming tools. And Satan, hallelujah, will be bound for a thousand years. Isaiah 24 says, They shall beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift their sword against nations, neither shall there be any war. So we have this period of time in the millennium when everything will be fine. But at the end of the millennium, Satan will be released, but he will be cast out forever. It's hard to believe, but men, at the end of that time, men will still choose Satan before God. So we have in Revelation 20, verse 7, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations. They will go into the corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and gather, to the battle, and gather them for battle in a number. They are like, this is where it tells us about the number of people that will choose uh, Satan instead of our Messiah. So their number will be the number of the sea, sand on the seashore. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning fire, sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet have been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever. God will finally cleanse the earth on the eighth day. And all the prophecies will come into fulfillment. While John was on the Isle of Patmos, God gave him visions of what will be happening on the eighth day, a new heaven and a new earth, city of Jerusalem. I want to read um, quite a large portion, actually. Um, so if you want to follow it, you can do, um, or ju just listen to it. Because I think this is important, because we need to see and know what it's going to be like. And I heard 19, verse, Revelation 19, verse 6. And I heard as the sound of a great multitude, and as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of strong thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns, omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and we will give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, us, have prepared herself. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said to me, Right, blessed are those who have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 21.9 and one of the seven angels who had seven vials full of the last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me that great city, the holy city descending out of heaven. having the glory of God and its lights was like a, 
like a stone most precious, even a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And it had a great wall with 12 gates, and on the gates were 12 angels, and having names inscribed, which are the names of the 12 tribes of, of the sons of Israel. From the east three gates, from the north three gates, from the south three gates, and from the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations in them. And the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. He who talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and its walls. And the city lies four square. I won't go through the measurements, because I'll tell you about the measurements in a minute. And the foundations of the walls of the, of the city had been do, adorned with very precious stone. The first foundation, jasper, sapphire, f emerald. I'm, not, I'm just t p picking bits out here. Respectively, each one of the gates was pearl. And the city was of pure gold, as transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty is the temple, even the Lamb. And the city had no need of sun, that they might shine in it, and in, in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations of those who are saved will walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. And its gates may not be shut all day, for there shall be no night, and there shall bring the glory and honor of the nations in it. And there shall be no way to enter anything that defiles or makes anything, sorry, or making any abomination or lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the earth is going to be cleansed. We're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. Sin cannot be anywhere near God. He will not have sin anywhere near him. We, the bride, will be with God in the new Jerusalem. And we're talking here about the eighth day. Shelley talked some time ago about the city, and she gave the dimensions. That's why I didn't go through it all. But I looked up the dimensions and what they would seem to be like. And it's 100, no, 1,400 miles or 1,500 miles in length and width, because it's a bit like a cube. And it's got a square base, obviously. Do you know, it's larger than India. That city is going to be larger than India. And it's nearly two million square miles. And that's in Revelation 21, 17, if you want to look that up. And a building in the city, this is just take one of the buildings, is as high as a generous 12, 12 foot roomed story, right? But it, the building would actually be over 600,000 stories. It's going to be so big. Look at the size of us. This is the bride's going to be big. She's going to be big and she's going to be beautiful. Oh. Right. Okay. So we know there's going to be no need for a temple. But what there will be, there will be rivers that run through the streets. And you, you know, I, I read earlier that there'll be no, there'll be no sea. And you think if there's no sea, where are the rivers going to go? Where are they going to go? And in reading, I have to quote him because you, all, all you academics will have read him. <laughs> Clarence Larkin. <laughs> I, re I read in his book, he suggests that the sea possibly means, and I'm not 
I'm saying it does. That there must be an outlet for the, for the rivers through the streets. So he suggests it could be that the word sea means vast oceans. So there's got to be little, some places. Okay. There'll be no need of light. That's hard to imagine. Especially if you get up in the middle of the night and you, you, there's no light. But it's going to be no light. And that's because the glory of God will be shining. And we'll be in that glory of God. There'll be no night. Oh, we can't imagine because we have a morning and an evening, don't we? But there's going to be no night. <laughs> we won't have to go to bed. <laughs> You know, his promises are yes and amen. So anything that we're reading in our Bibles, that's, that's what's going to happen. We can't argue. We can't say, will it, won't it? It will. But I want to finish on a little story here that I read. And I, it, it's a bit sort of, it'll, it'll be a bit jumpy, but it's just to prove about the preparation. There was a, a long, long time ago, and it must be long because you'll understand why in a minute. But in the USA, there was a, a meeting going on of the Senates, senators, and they were with the President of America. And often in that room was talked about end times. But this particular day, it went pitch black. This whole city went pitch black. Yeah, wh yeah, why Washington? And it went pitch black, and it was dense. It was, it was like a thick denseness. And one of the senators really got disturbed. And he said, L -l let's conclude this meeting. Let's all go home. He really believed that it was end times. So another well-known senator, it doesn't say who, he just said, no. We're not going to do that. He said, let's bring more lights in. Let's bring more lights in. So you must realize it must have been a long time ago because we'd have just turned the lights on. So it's obviously in the days with oil lamps or whatever. And he said, no, bring the lights in. Bring the lights in. Bring the feasts in. Bring the feasts in. Bring the Lord's commandments in. Bring them in. He didn't say that. I'm saying that. Because he said, you know, we don't want to, you know, we want, when the, when, when, um, when the boss comes back, we've got to be about our father's business. And what he meant was, you know, if we just, we, take no, we don't take any notice of these warnings, if we don't understand what the feasts are all about, we're not going to be ready, we're going to be frightened. But if we're about our father's business, we're safe. So I'll end there and thank you.